Good morning. It's good to see so many of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are so excited that you have chosen to seek out God this morning, to seek after spiritual things. We ask that you stick around for a little bit after services. Let's get to know you. Let's get to help you. If you open your Bibles this morning to 1 Samuel chapter 15, and if you don't mind dog earing or if you have a bookmark in your Bible, I would say put a bookmark here in this chapter. Uh, We'll be covering the first 22 verses of this chapter here this morning. When I worked in retail for the very short time that I did, um, there was a few occasions where the manager would come up to me, drop a major project on my desk, say, I don't care how you do it, I need it done by tomorrow. It was an ends justify the means mentality. He didn't care if I have to work all night, if I had to take time off from our projects. This took priority. I don't care the method, but it needs to be done. Unfortunately, that mentality sometimes creeps into the way we serve God. So long as the end is the same as it would be otherwise, it shouldn't matter how we got there, some would say. Others would say that so long as our pews are full, it doesn't really matter so long as the intent was good. If there's one thing you take away this morning from this lesson, it would be verse 22, and we're going to go there and then we're going to jump back to the beginning. But to obey is better than sacrifice. The ends do not justify the means. This was Saul's problem. So going to 1 Samuel 15, we're going to start here, looking at the first six verses to start off with. There's a couple lessons we can learn here. So starting in verse 1, Then Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, and how he sent himself, set himself on the way while he, was com- while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. Do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Then Saul summoned the people and numbered them and tell him, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush of the city. Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go, uh, go down from among the Amalekites, so I will not destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Starting off here in the section, God through the prophet reminds Saul on how he got there. Samuel reminds Saul that it was God who put you in charge. It is God is the source of your greatness. It was God who put you as king. So, remind, so remember that and humble yourself for, about, for he's about ready to give you a command to do. This makes sense considering Saul's history with following God's commands. If you turn over just a few short chapters ago in 1 Samuel chapter 13, here we, ha- we see an earlier campaign that Saul was waging against the enemies of Israel with the Philistines. And starting in verse 8, Now when he had waited seven days according to the appointed time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gagal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring to me the burnt offerings and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offerings. As soon as he finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him and greet him. But Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattering from me, and you did not come within the appointed days, and that the Philistines were assembling by, by Manishas. Therefore I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gagal. And he has not asked the favor for the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Saul acted arrogantly. Or as the text would say in the next verse, you have acted foolishly 
you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established you a kingdom over Israel forever. And look at his consequence here in verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not endure. The Lord has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has appointed him ruler over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord had commanded you. See, this actually goes back to when Israel demanded a king. We want to be like the other nations. We don't care that we we are set apart in particular. We want a king to be like the other nations. And Saul was a king like the other nations. He took it upon himself to act as priest. Him not being of the tribe of Levi, having no right to offer those sacrifices, he took it upon himself because of impatience. Again, going back to the introductory marks, so long as the ends are the same, what, what does not matter? Saul had said to himself, get impatient. We need the sacrifices. I'm not going to pay attention to who's supposed to offer the sacrifices. Considering Saul's history, it makes perfect sense why God would try and remind him one last time to humble himself before him. Also in the first section here, we see that God is just and merciful. We have the Amalekites, and this has been a section that some critics of the Bible will, will come out and attack and say, well, this just seems arbitrary. He's just commanding genocide here. Not so. This is not a new problem. The Amalekites have been a thorn in Israel's side for four centuries. Put it in perspective, this country's only been around for roughly 230. And we haven't had an enemy that's plagued us the entire time of our country. We've had different enemies, but we haven't had the same enemy. Imagine 400 years of the same people. And it wasn't, just, it wasn't like the Amalekites had faced off with Israel's soldiers or strong men in the Exodus. If you turn over to Exodus chapter 17. Starting in verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephilim. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men from us to go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill and the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and they sat on him, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial, recite it to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out and out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And he said, The Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. This is Israel in the Exodus. They don't have a standing army. They don't have soldiers. They're a weak target for our own intents and purposes. And Amalek preys upon them. It's only through the grace and providence of God, grace and strength of God that they were able to overcome. But we can look in Deuteronomy chapter 25. They're still a problem. Or you look in Judges chapter 6 and verse 3. They're still a problem. They're raiding Israel. God had given the Amalekites 400 years of mercy to try and change. 400 years to do something different. But they chose not to. And part of God's justice is that mercy eventually does run out if the people are unrepentant. On the other hand, we have another group of people, the Kenites, who did receive mercy because they were shown mercy to Israel. If you want to write this down in Exodus chapter 17, nope, 
Sorry, that's the wrong verse. And the Exodus, these people, these, um, sorry, lost my notes. Kenites, there we go. The Kenites were of Moses' in-laws. Jethro was a Kenite. And so when Israel had safely made it past the Exodus, Jethro had blessed God and praised God for the safe travel of Israel. He had shown mercy to them. Because of that, 400 years later, the Kenites received mercy. The other lesson we learn here is that God's will will be done. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter our time, uh, if it's not a timetable to our liking. But because God has willed something all the way even 400 years prior in Exodus chapter 17, means it will be accomplished one way or another. He promised there in the, that 14th verse that he will destroy any trace of Amalek. So this is not an arbitrary command being given to Saul. This is not something out of the blue. This is not, as the critics would say, God being bipolar. No, this is God being logical and faithful. These people, their time had run out. They had shown no signs of change. Praying upon a small nation who could not realistically defend itself except by the power of God. If you look in Romans chapter 2, tying a New, Te- New Testament principle here. Romans chapter 2, looking at verses 4 and 5. Paul talking about the impartiality of God. He says, or do, you, or do you think lightly of the richness of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Contextually, it's talking about the last time, the final judgment. The principle applies. The Amalekites during that whole 400 time period, they were building and storing up wrath for themselves, and the day of judgment was upon them. But regarding the command and Saul, it wasn't a complicated command. It was a straightforward command. It was a simple command. Nothing to decipher, nothing to study, nothing to do word studies on, nothing complex where you needed a whole commentary to figure it out. It was simple. Destroy them. The point we we can find the application for ourselves is that God, when it comes to communicating His will, does not make it difficult. You could look back in the garden, Genesis chapter 3. He was very simple with Adam and Eve. Don't eat from that tree. Don't do it. Or the New Testament principle, Matthew chapter 28, looking at verses 19 through 20, the Great Commission. All authorities begin unto me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. That's a very simple and direct command. We are to make disciples. God communicates his will plainly. But despite that, despite Saul being a very simple, direct command, he still could not complete it. I like to call this Saul's partial obedience. Going back to the chapter here. Starting in verse 7. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havalah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I made Saul king over a king, for he has turned his back from following me, and he has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and when it came to Samuel, saying, Saul, come to Carmel. And behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on on down to Gagile. 
Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought themselves from, uh, brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice the Lord your God. But the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Wait, and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak. He captured Agag alive. That's a direct violation of the simple command he was given in verse 3. Destroy them all, utterly. Spare no one. He and the people, and I emphasize and there because this will come up later, he and the people kept the choice spoils. Again, not what God commanded. The point that partial obedience in, God, uh, in God's eyes is the same as full disobedience. Saul could have not have carried out the command and the punishment would have been the same. He did not do what the Lord had commanded him. You look at Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. They destroyed, in 1 Samuel 15, they destroyed what was convenient. They destroyed what was easy. When you're raiding and pillaging and you're, and you're fighting against a king, it's easy to get rid of the things that are profane and worthless. The straw, the pots, the beds, the furniture. But the thing that mattered most, the choice spoils, the best of the oxen and the sheep, and the king himself, they couldn't bring themselves to do that. In a sense, they were offering God the leftovers. In Malachi chapter 1, unfortunately, giving God the leftovers would be the pro a problem that would plague Israel for their entire history. Looking at verse 6 of Malachi chapter 1, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you. O priest who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar, but you say, how have we defiled you? And that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. Again, in ancient society, to capture a king of, alive was like the greatest accolade you could have as commander and the greatest humiliation you could have as a nation. And so again, Saul, arrogant Saul, Saul who was concerned about himself, as we saw, he built a monument to himself, captured him because he knew what this would mean for him and all everything else related to that. He would get the choice spoils. Didn't matter. And the interesting thing is his failure to obey the command completely would have serious consequences for Israel later down the road. In Esther chapter 3 and verse 1, we read about Haman, the Agite, a descendant of King Agag, one who made it escape the destruction because Saul did not carry out the command. And what did Haman do? Haman was the one who made sure that that proclamation to kill all the Jews got passed by the king. Generations later, Saul's choice still had consequences. I bring this up to illustrate the point that partial obedience is no obedience at all. And we don't, when we do not submit ourselves to God, we have no idea the consequences that could follow. I'm sure Saul was not thinking that he was putting the entire nation at risk centuries later when they were in captivity. In fact, I don't think he was thinking much of the future at all. Then we have Saul's true colors here. Going back to the text, verse 5, 12, verse 12. Behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded down to Gagile. 
The proverb says in Proverbs 16, verse 18, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's almost if you were going to put this in a sitcom situation. Saul is saying to himself, I have a great idea. I'm going to make a monument to this, commemorate this great victory. This is a great thing. I'm so great. The narrator would then come in and say, it was not a great idea. This was a bad idea. It was bad from the get-go. And I, again, I, this indicates something about his character. He didn't create an altar to offer thanks to God for the victory. He did not create a monument to commemorate God's faithfulness as Samuel did previously in chapter 13 after the victory over the Philistines. They created an altar, a monument that God is my banner. No. He creates a monument to himself. And also in his mind, he had thought that he did what God had commanded. Verse 13, I have carried out the command of the Lord. Samuel corrects him. But this shows that the ends don't justify the means. See, Saul made two great mistakes. One, so long as the end is the same, the means do not matter. That was his first mistake. And the second mistake was assuming that whatever I offer God, he will accept. Looking at Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 22. Jesus says here, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out many demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Verse 22, those are good things, good results. People being demon-possessed free, people being healed. But Jesus said because they were not obeying him and following him, that they will have no part with me. The spoils would have, I mean, in a practical terms, what King Saul did, these spoils would have been divided amongst the army and everybody would have been enriched. A good thing. But he did not obey God. He didn't do what he told him to do. So in reality, it's not a good thing. In human terms, good work. But when it comes to God's divine standard, it was not. And this brings up the point that God can and will refuse sacrifices. God can and will refuse worship if it is not according to what he wants. We can look at Cain and Abel. Genesis chapter, three, ver chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. One offered a God-pleasing sacrifice, as the Hebrew writer tells us, because it was from faith, and the other one offered an unpleasing sacrifice. Nadab and Abihu did not listen to what the law of the Lord said, and they offered up profane fire unto the Lord, and what happened? They were destroyed. And before their dad could object, Moses said to him, By those who come near me, I will be treated as holy. It's what the Lord said. So their father was quiet. God can and refuse sacrifice. God can and refuse worship. If it's not according to what he wants. But going back now to the chapter. Starting in verse 17. Samuel said, Is it not true... Though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of all the tribes of Israel. And the Lord anointed you over king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil 
and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. I went on the mission, and which the Lord sent me on. I brought back Agag, the king of, the, of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choices of the things, devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gagal. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. This is God's second reminder to Saul in the same chapter. Gets a little bit more detailed this time. You were lowly. You were lowly in practical terms. In your own eyes, you were nothing. But God elevated you. God made you king over all the tribes. He blessed you richly. Because of this, why did you disobey him then? Samuel almost is confused here. Why would anyone who has been so richly blessed by God ever disobey him? And that question is just as relevant today as it was back then, especially in this country. I've used this illustration before, but the fact that you and I had to choose what socks to wear this morning, what shirt, what tie, what coat, what pair of shoes. We are immensely blessed. And oftentimes, including myself, take it for granted when that should not be the case. God gave him a simple mission. Then we have Saul's delusion here in the text. I did obey. I brought back the king. You see, he's adding to the command. He thought that was part of the command. He added that somewhere. He had deluded himself so much he actually believed it. Even though Samuel, I, I don't think Samuel stuttered here in the text, or he was misspeaking back in verse 3. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has, and do not spare him. But put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. I don't see, but take the king alive. I see, destroy them utterly. But it's interesting that he immediately begins to cast blame. It was the people. Not me. They wanted to offer them the sacrifice. That's why I said, note verse 9, Saul and the people spare the choice spoils. Bit of a rotten friend. I throw you underneath the bus like that, but He casts blame, makes excuses. It was not the people. Then we have God's rebuke, which is really the thrust of the chapter and where we're going to close here. It's the main point. What does God want more? Sacrifice or obedience? Rote service or a willing heart? Verse 22 again. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen, as the ESV says, than the fat of rams. If we were to do a study of Malachi and how the state of worship got in late period Israel, God eventually tells them, I wish somebody would destroy the temple, shut the doors, stop the sacrifices. Because it means nothing to you. You profane and insult me when you do these things. Nothing we can do, no matter works of goodness, sacrifice, 
will ever make up for humbly, by humbly submitting to God in obedience. Nothing. I can go on pilgrimage every year. I can give all my clothes away to the poor. I can give alms to every person I find. Donate blood monthly. The list goes on. But if I'm not doing what God wants, all that is for nothing. Now, if I'm doing what God wants and I'm doing that, I am blessed. But if I'm not obeying God, I'm in trouble. Because when it comes down to the end of the day, God wants a willing heart, not rote worship. In Jeremiah chapter 7, God speaking concerning the law that he gave the fathers when they came out of Egypt. Concerning the Mosaical law. He says in chapter 7, starting verse 22. 21 for context. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in in that day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people, and you will walk in my way which I command you, that it may be well with you. The words of God himself. I did not command them concerning sacrifices, I command them concerning their heart. That's what he wants. Now, the obedient, willing heart will do the sacrifices. But you can't get those two mixed around. You can't assume that if I do all the sacrifices and don't have a willing heart, that God's going to accept it. The contrite heart must precede the worship, must precede the service. Really, we have a two contrasting characters in this chapter. We have Samuel, one who obeyed God at every step. And we have Saul, who routinely did not follow through and rebelled. So my question is, who are you going to be? Are you going to be a Samuel? Are you going to be a Saul? Are you going to obey God's voice and become one of his people? Or live in rebellion or partial obedience. The Bible tells us that in order to come into relationship with God and the first step in humbly submitting to Him, first step in obeying Him, is you need to get into Christ. We cover Galatians. Great study. In chapter 3, verses 26 and 27. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. That's how you get in. That's how you submit yourself to God. It's the ultimate act of submission. In that act, you're crying out to God, I can't do it. I, nothing I can ever do will be good enough. I need you, Almighty God. If we can help you this morning by putting on Christ in baptism, we would love to do so. If you need prayers of strength, prayers of restoration, we can only help if we know. If you have a need, please come forward as here we sing the song of invitation.